Yeah, uh, at work, I usually speak for two, two and a half hours uh, per session, so I'll try to not get quite that long. I've been thinking a lot uh, today about choices. George Jones sort of, uh, recorded the song about choices. Um, he didn't make a lot of good choices at the beginning of his life, as, as the song uh, indicates. But um, toward the end, he did make some better choices. Uh, I had choices, this is the way the song starts out. And it ends with living and dying with the choices I've made. So choices, they, they, they have a lot of impact on us. Um, there was a lady, Barbara Kaufman, might be related to you, I don't know. Um, she made a choice uh, back in... 1780s, 1785 or so, and her husband was captured by Continental soldiers uh, during revolutionary conflict, and she made a decision, you know, she got deathly ill, she became very sick, and she was on her deathbed, her husband was not home, and she had five children and didn't know what to do with them. She chose to put them in Amish Mennonite homes, in Christian homes. Uh, that one choice by 1944 uh, translated into about 450 of those descendants being ministers of the gospel. That one choice she made really made an impact on the kingdom of God. So our, our choices, uh, our choices have a big impact, whether we uh, know it or not. Uh, I don't know if any of you seen the genealogy fan. It's a it's a big fan that uh, it lists all your <coughs> back seven generations. There's um, 284 people that have personally impacted my life. Most of the, every one of those was a professing Christian. And I suppose there was some give and take there. But I would like to ask, what kind of impact do you think that has on a person? Like, like if the seven generations, everybody would be Christian, how would that impact the person's life? Would it make a difference? Sure it would. Uh, what kind of difference? Well, if they were Christians, I guess it would behoove you to follow the same path. Okay. Uh, well, how about the first generation Christian? Let's say uh, we just talked to a fellow yesterday. He said that his grandmother was a prostitute and... His grandfather was a high up in the Navy that never married the, his grandmother. So he's just now, he's, a, he's about my age, and he's just now starting to go to church. How does that impact him? It makes a difference. The choices we make do, do really make a difference. Um, so... So I'm, I'm thinking of a, a poem that I learned years ago. Actually, Molly and Ellen's grandfather, I don't know the grandfather, but their uncle, Jonas J. Miller, he, he and I went to uh, uh, Grantsville, Maryland, and I fell asleep while he was driving. I was about 14, and when I woke up, he's quoting this poem. So I'd, I'd like to read the poem for you. Uh, before I do, 
My job is talking to people, trying to take the areas in their lives that have crashed and burned and see if they can be restored, recovered, redeemed. And that's awesome. It's a, it's a tremendous privilege, but what about if we made choices uh, to not crash and burn and to listen to what people are encouraging us to do and get pointed in the right direction? Um, in about 1995, the um, Teen Challenge from New York City came to our area and they were going to do a prison uh, ministry time. And these guys were not from Christian background, they were not from church background. Uh, they were on the streets, they were drug addicts, they were uh, immoral, they just had everything going against them. And our church youth hosted uh, a dinner before they went to the prison for ministry. And I remember they were sharing their testimonies to us, feeling like, well, you know, I don't even, do we even have a testimony? And it was like, you know, we needed to be in the dregs of society so that we could have a testimony of redemption so that we were, are worth something. But it was interesting, uh, one, of the, one of the fellows stood up and he said, you know the same grace of God that took us out of the gutter can keep you from ever going to the gutter. And I thought that was, that's really, that was really something. I'll never forget it. But back to uh, Jonas, here's the poem that he wrote, or he quoted, and I would, I would like to hear some discussion on it after I get done reading it, if I can read it properly. I should get my wife up here, she's a, she's a poet and a poet reader. For the dangerous cliff, as they freely confessed, though to walk near its crest was so pleasant, but over its terrible edge there had slipped a duke and full many a peasant. So the people said something would have to be done, but their project did not at all tally. Some said, put up a fence around the edge of the cliff. Some, an ambulance down in the valley. But the cry for the ambulance carried the day, for it spread through the neighboring city. A fence may be useful or not, it is true, but each heart became full of pity for those who had slipped over the dangerous cliff and dwellers in highways and alleys gave pound and pence, not to put up a fence, but an ambulance down in the valley. For the cliff is all right if you're careful, they said, and if folks even slip and are dropping, it isn't the slipping that hurts them so much, it's the shock down below when they're stopping. So day after day, as these mishaps occurred, quick forth would those rescuers sally to pick up the, villa, the victims who fell off the cliff with their ambulance down in the valley. Then an old sage remarked, It's a marvel to me that people give far more attention to repairing results than stopping the cause, when there's much better aim at prevention. Let us stop at its source, all this mischief, cried he. Come, neighbors and friends, let us rally. If the cliff we will fence, we might almost dispense of the ambulance down in the valley. Oh, he's a fanatic, the others rejoined. Dispense with the ambulance? Never. He'd dispense with all charities, too, if he could. No, no, we'll support them forever. Aren't we picking up folks just as fast as they fall? And shall this man dictate to us, shall he? Why should people of sense stop to put up a fence while the ambulance works in the valley? But a sensible few who are practical too 
will not bear with this nonsense much longer. They believe that prevention is better than cure, and their party will soon be the stronger. Encourage them then with your purse, voice, and pen, and while other philanthropists dally, they will scorn all pretense and put up a stout fence on the cliff that hangs over the valley. Better guide well the young than reclaim them when old. For the voice of true wisdom is calling. To rescue the fallen is good, but is best to prevent other people from falling. <clears throat> Better close up the source of temptation and crime than deliver from dungeon or galley. Better put up a strong fence around the top of the cliff than an ambulance down in the valley. What are your thoughts about the content? What is the author trying to say? Any thoughts? Is it something that's actually doable? Is it something that can be done? Look at, look at the way things are going in our world today. We don't, we, we cannot define male or female, man or woman. We don't, we don't know that anymore. Somehow we've lost track of what that is. There's so much confusion. There's so much temptation at our fingertips everywhere we turn. Can we make decisions? Can we make choices that will keep us from going across that cliff? into oblivion because many people that go over that cliff aren't rescued. They never get to the ambulance. And I, as I've been thinking about that, I just, I, I think of the, I just think of the, I, I think of some of the people here at this church. I see people reaching out to young people. I see people uh, going, doing a children's church. They're doing things, they're reaching out into the community. They're, they're deciding to do something to make a difference in other people's lives. That's incredible. The young people are doing it. How about us older folk? Are we doing something? Are we doing something that will protect and keep us from buying into all the garbage that is around us and being promoted day by day. And we, we get immune to it after a while, if you think about it. We, we get a little bit immune to it. God help us not to become immune to it. God help us to uh, think about and make good choices and decisions. We're all faced with temptation. What happens when you make a decision to do something wrong? Uh, Vernon asked me to talk about the brain. Well, I wasn't going to, but I guess I will a little bit. Um, every nerve cell in your brain is, is like a little tree. It has roots and it has branches. Every time you hear something, learn something new, those branches actually physically grow. Right now, as you're listening to me, those branches in your brain aren't growing. If you would think about what I'm saying again and again and again, it gets stronger, the branches get bigger. When your branches get bigger, you think about it more. When you think about it more, the branches grow more. So let's say you're addicted to something. Let's say you're addicted to alcohol or drugs. Uh, and that urge to go down that road again hits you and you start to do it. You form a neurological pathway in your brain that takes you back to that place again and again. After a while, it puts a myelin sheath around this whole neurological pathway that you don't even have to make a decision to go back to your addiction, whatever it might be. 
you just go there. Like you start to feel something negative and boom, you're on that path and you're going to the place that you don't even want to go. And every time you go down that road, it gets more and more hardwired into your brain. If you make choices today, I'm not going that way. I think about that fan I talked about a few minutes ago. That fan where most of the people in my background were Christian people, ministers, godly people. That has impacted my life. But what about the person that, the first generation Christian, who came from a uh, very uh, shaky means? What about him? Do you know that if that person stops and makes that choice to go the right way, you can't do it without God's help, of course not. But you make that choice, you make that decision, and you turn, you might be just like Christian Miller who was put in the homes of Hans Beiler, and he became the first Amish bishop in um, Somerset County, Pennsylvania. And of his descendants were many, many ministers and uh, preachers. One decision by you can impact hundreds and hundreds of people. Let's make good choices. Let's make great choices. Let's make godly choices uh, right now. It's, we're always tempted just to give in a little, just take a little half step towards what we ought not to go. Let's, let's make those choices, good choices, so we don't wind up like George Jones in the last couple of years, turning some things around, and he tells us how difficult it was to give up some of the things that he was struggling with. That's all I want to say. God bless you. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get the two hours in, but um, you want to get the two hours, come over to the office and we'll fill you in. That's my cost. Oh, yeah. <laughs>